Coming up right now, the Swamp News Podcast with your host, Joe Blackburn. What's up? What's up? It's your main man, Joe Blackburn. And today, making his 100% brand new debut, we got Alligator Aaron and Mr. Aaron Joyner. What's up, Aaron? What's going on? What's going on? Good to have you here, man. You know, I've always said, like, I need to start, like, introducing the show as soon as, like, the, the countdown goes down to zero and, like, say a couple of cool things first, and then I can hit my, like, you just hit my button, and then I can play the intro like all the other cool shows do. But I'm like, nah, I got to kind of stick with it. But anyways, we'll, uh, we'll let everybody kind of start joining the show. But uh, again, Aaron, glad, glad to have you on. Uh, it's good to have another fellow Gator join me. Last week, we had my brother, Brett, join me. Of course, uh, you know, uh, Aaron, you've been uh, a, a moderator and a friend of mine for, what, going on four years now. Uh, me yep. and Aaron actually have quite a bit in common, uh, much like Brett. You're also a big Braves fan like myself. Uh, unfortunately, outside of the fact that, yes, we we share a strong bond, of course, with the Gators and the Braves now, uh, uh, but you're, you're unfortunately, you're a Jags fan, which I don't hate the Jags, of course, <laughs> Jags are great. I mean, they had a great season. I'm, I'm happy for you, you know, uh, but uh, I'm a Saints fan. You know, I mean, I, I, I guess you could say like, you know, I'll root for the Jags, but it's not like, you know, it's just hard for me to to believe that they're ever going to. I mean, like when Urban kind of took over, I was like, you know what? I'll root for the Jags. And then they got rid of them and then they started doing well. I'm like, you know what? I don't know, man. But anyways, um, go ahead. Uh, tell me, tell me, tell us a little bit about yourself, Aaron. Give us a, give us a little bit of background. You know, it's your first time on, on a live show and on gate on swamp news and Gator nation. Tell us a little bit about what you do and who you are. Sure. Uh, so my name is Aaron, uh, last name Joyner. Uh, so I've been a big Gator fan. I'd say probably, uh, since high school, uh, me and my buddy, you know, I mean, we used to uh, go to all the games, you know, when uh, back in the glory days, you know, I mean, the yeah. 06, 08, you know, Tebow years and just going to the swamp, you know, I mean, was just unreal, you know, especially at that time. And I just I just absolutely, you know, fell in love, just to be honest with you. Um, my whole family is, uh, is Georgia fans. And honestly, I probably should be a Georgia fan, but I, thank God I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, um, being able to, you know, I mean, be a Gator since that time and rubbing in my, you know, family's faces has been uh, nothing, nothing short of spectacular. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, regardless of that, you know, I mean, uh, just trying to, you know, live like everybody else, man, you know, I mean, and uh, just for some reason, just continue to get sucked in and just addicted you know, to the, to the Gator land and, you know, Gator nation and the, all the camaraderie, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I see. And look, uh, I got to give you a lot of props. And as, as he alluded to, like he, like his whole family, he's like Georgia fans and he just happened to show up at the swamp one day and became a Gator. So he's supposed to be a Georgia bulldog, everybody, but we got a lot to get into. We can have that conversation, but I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and you know, uh, also Aaron helps out a lot in the group and obviously, you know, there's a lot going on. I mean, we have a big, uh, big season ahead of us and, you know, let's jump right into it. You know, we have a huge game and we are counting down the hours the minutes the seconds i mean we are under the 12 day mark i mean it is officially the steve spurrier day i guess you could say right i mean is that true what i mean we're technically 12 or is that it's the 20th of august so i'm terrible at math i don't even want to pretend so we're either 12 or 11 days away you do you tell me aaron i'm not even gonna try to do that math nevertheless as we get closer and under a week i'll officially be like ready to count down the days um but this bodes the question if we go in there, regardless of Cam Rising, regardless of if it's the third string quarterback playing, or I guess technically the second string quarterback playing right now, and we beat Utah, this game and this record of one and zero feel is going to feel different to me. I don't feel like like last year we go in, we didn't know anything about Billy Napier, we didn't know anything about this football team. This year we do have a little better, bit better of an understanding. And my personal opinion is we are far more disciplined and we are far more capable of sustained success this year because we will be more of a consistent football team. Regardless, regardless if we go five wins or if we go 10 wins, it will be a consistent tackling, a consistent catching, a consistent, you know, defensive team, a consistent offensive team. We will be far more ready to be a consistent team period. Now that's just my opinion. I'm a very bullish. I, I people have heard my predictions. Eight wins is my bottom. 10 wins is probably my top. Um, if we got lucky and got an 11th one there, it would be a surprise to me. Um, if we got unlucky and we got seven losses, it wouldn't 
be crazy. I could see seven. Uh, I mean, excuse me, only seven wins. I could see that. I could see it would be it would be crazy to me for us to only get six wins, though. That would be low. That would be I, I, I could not imagine that. Where do you stand on that barometer? You know, I've kind of gone back and forth with this, to be honest with you. I really think, and you know, I mean, uh, there can be a lot of people that could probably hate me for this. A lot of people will say eight and four. Um, I know, you know, Shane Matthews says eight and four. Uh, I, I personally just think that I, I, I believe that we'll go seven and five. I, I don't think we're going to be at like, you know, the bottom, you know what I mean? But either way, um, if we go, you know, six and six, it won't be great. Uh, but it will still be okay to, you know, pull us through, you know, into the, into the lagway uh, years, but, uh, and seasons, but honestly, seven and five is, is kind of my, that, that's just kind of what I'm stuck on. I would love to go eight and four. I'd love to go nine and three. Um, I just tend to see that, you know, I mean, I think we have a really good, I honestly think we have a really good start. But I think that it starts to get a little tougher down the road. And I think that we maybe drop, you know, a game or maybe we're exhausted after another game or something like that. Uh, and I think that's where we kind of end out at seven and five. Regardless, you know, I mean, I, I do believe that we are going to have a winning season this year under under Coach Napier and the current staff that's involved. Yeah, no, I mean, that's fair. You know, what's crazy to me, uh, our good friend Thomas Smith shows up. I'm going to I'll get to I'll get to. Thomas, don't go nowhere because we're going to have our moment, brother. I can't wait till you mean you get your chance to go on screen and go battle. But uh, our, our good friend Thomas Smith, anybody who's watched the show, I mean, I, one day when I have my Fonbaum, Fon like when I'm Paul Fonbaum and I'm on ESPN, Thomas, we're going to go talk about these glory days when we're going head to head on these epic battles. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll get there. Uh, but, you know, I think it's funny. This, so I pulled up, Aaron, as I mean, you talked about earlier, the ESPN FBI game by game predictions for Florida. All right, this was put out um, just a couple days ago, this updated one. And they've got a 32.1% chance for Florida to win the Utah game. And to me, like, obviously, you know, Cam Rising's up in the air, and that's going to change, you know, uh, the prediction model, I think, you know. But I don't think it does in a lot of ways. It does change what they're capable of doing. But, I mean, how much of a difference maker is Cam Rising at his current form, Aaron? Honestly, with the way that he is right now, and I mean, I've seen a couple of practice videos uh, from the um, from earlier in the month. He honestly looks like a scarecrow. He really honestly just looks like he's just standing there. He can barely put any weight on that knee. Um, and even if he just somehow miraculously comes through and he just is able to, you know, I mean, confidently stand in the pocket and deliver, you know, I mean, uh, good throws with. With Armstrong, you know, I mean, in this this front seven that's going to be coming, I just don't think he stands a chance. And honestly, it's kind of, in my opinion, you know, irresponsible. You know, if you're going to put Cam Rising up there against this Gator defense in a non-conference game, you know, to me, it just shows that it's like you really, you know, I mean, don't care that much about the conference and, you know, I mean, winning that conference. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, you're going to be uh, putting him out there and you're just going to be like, you're just going to be putting him in danger for not necessarily a meaningless game, but it's not as important, you know, to the conference and to the championship that you're trying to win. Yeah, so in my smart. opinion, if they were smart, you know, I mean, then what they would do is they would hold him off maybe a couple more months, make sure that he was able to fully heal from that ACL uh, injury. But it yeah. seems that with that backup quarterback uh, that got hurt, uh, that they were going to, it seemed like, push through. And now they're having to rely on potentially, you know, a third string quarterback, Bryson Barnes, yeah. um, that it seems like it's more likely that Cam Rising may actually come in. Do I think that he plays a whole game? Absolutely not. But I do believe that if they throw Bryson Barnes in, like, to start – and then maybe he's not getting the job done. I think that they might throw him in either at the, you know, I mean, the end of the game during crunch time, or maybe during some plays where they might need to, you know, have a, a nice long bomb throw to be able to, you know, move the chains. That's, yeah, that's I, where I think it's going to make a difference. I think you just nailed it. Depends on what the score might be for how much she have, might have to play. Right. So, uh, and, and you know, 
to even a, a bigger point here too is what are the goals of Cam Rising this season? What did why did he come back? Did he come back to win a national championship? Did he come back to get picked number three in the draft this year? That's the goals I don't and, and I'm not aware of what Cam Rising came back to do because I mean he went. I mean honestly speaking, he probably came back because he tore his ACL and he didn't have a choice and he wants to get drafted in the NFL. So. If I'm Cam Rising, I'm not playing in this game because I'm trying to go to the NFL next year. And honestly, Utah ain't winning a national championship. And and if they think they are, they're fooling it. He's fooling. They're fooling themselves. That doesn't mean that you don't try to win this football game. That doesn't mean you don't go out and you try to do your very best. And you know, I have a lot of respect for Utah and you know how how much they they. They, I mean, it's not like they can recruit powerhouse kids to come play at that. They do a lot of in-house recruiting and not a lot of kids come out from out of state to play there. But anyways, let's, let's move on past this game. I mean, we've beat this game to death just on this channel alone. So let's move into the, uh, the, the big point of this, of this today's uh, show. And that is what happens post Utah. Now, everybody stick with us here. I personally believe Joe Blackburn, the main man himself is of the belief that we go into Utah Defense dominates, and Florida has some some pretty sustained success. But more importantly, that we score some defensive points, maybe, or we get a couple turnovers and put our offense in success in a successive uh, position to to uh, to make some really easy points and do really really well for our uh, our 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 dear Gators. Now we're going to leave Utah happy, in my opinion. Uh, would you agree with that? Um, uh, I think we are in agreement, at least, Aaron. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I do believe we come away uh, with the win. At Utah, so and we're going to move past that. From that point forward, yeah, and from that point forward, it'll just be a little nice little cakewalk into McNeese. So, to to me, it's very important that the next six games that we discuss leading up to Georgia, we're going to go, we're going to head to this. This show specifically is going to focus up to the Tennessee game and to Tennessee, and then post Tennessee to Georgia. All right, we're going to talk about those games, and to me, this is important because those are the games that I felt like South Florida and Kentucky specifically. Where was our head that game? Those games. I mean, did we just think we were great after Utah? Did Coach Napier not know what to do or know how to control those guys? Was it was kind of like post national championship Urban Meyer felt that it kind of felt like that. Like, like what did Urban Meyer do during the Alabama game or like after we'd won the national championship and we got absolutely curb stomped Tim Tebow senior year? That's kind of what it felt like without any success at all. But I mean, just like we were just completely outcompeted by everybody that mattered after that, you know, it, it just didn't feel real. I, I, I didn't feel like we were in any game, um, including South Florida. Like, how could we possibly be against South Florida even remotely, you know, uh, in, in any way, almost about to lose that game? I don't know how you felt about it, but I was like, what are we doing here? Right. So let's move on. Number one, make me state. If I have to have a conversation about make me state, I, I said it already like that now we're actually having the wrong conversation so we're moving past yeah. that tennessee all right tennessee per espn is favored to lose to us at the swamp as they should be because where is it at aaron because it's at the swamp right where it's supposed to be and they are favored to lose to us not favored they are expected to lose to us and i want to remind gator nation real quick everyone listen up it has been, I think, Aaron, you're the one who told me. What was it, 23 years? Was it you who pointed that out, or was it my brother? One of you pointed it out. 23 years, or give or take. Ron Zook era, prior to maybe even that, it has been that long since Tennessee has been in a winning position against the Florida Gators at the Swamp. Tennessee That's about right. has only had one year of a team that they felt like was better than us one single year. And you know what year that was, Mr. Joyner? I mean, last year. Last year. Yeah. Last and it was still year. back and forth, even with the terrible defense that we had. We, uh, we recovered an onside kick that almost allowed us a chance to win that game. Yep. And that was, again, the best – that's the best Tennessee team. Now they've had other teams that were competitive enough to potentially beat us. Don't get me wrong. Um, and uh, alien head, what was his name? What he, that the smoky grays and they beat us that year. 
Um, I mean, did they beat us that year? Was that year? You talking about Dodson? Yeah, man. Yes. I yeah. Guess that was it. Or Dobbs. 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 Joshua yeah, Dobbs. Yeah, yeah. Josh Dobbs. Dobbs. Yeah. They beat us that year too. I think it was this year. Yeah. Thanks. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, congrats. I guess that whatever. Um, I mean, a couple times in the past, like two decades. I, I yeah. it is what it is. You know what I mean? I mean, Kentucky has beat us more times, unfortunately. Um, I think Vanderbilt too. I mean, like literally, those two teams have beat us more more Ugh. than Tennessee has. How don't remind me. <laughs> yeah, but, but to the point of this is the team that people write are, are writing us off in a lot of different ways, and here we are, ESPN making some sense for once. So, as everybody will divert their attention to the screen, they actually have Tennessee losing to us at least in theory, per their algorithms that this should be a close game and the swamp will be fired up. So um, I, I I wanted to talk about this specifically with you today, Alligator Aaron, for this reason and this reason only, is that it is important for Gator Nation to remember that we own this series, that we are daddy, and that, you know, and I want to hear your opinion after this, after I get done with all my tangent, my soapbox here, is that it's not been until last year that anybody thought otherwise. So the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, and I agree with that. Uh, the year before, we absolutely just crushed them. I think it was something like 34 to 3 or somewhere around there. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and that's usually how it is. You know, we usually go in and we expect to beat Tennessee. I mean, you, you should, as a Gator fan, go in and expect to beat Tennessee. And that's whether you, you know, uh, play them at in the swamp, that's whether you uh, play them at, at you know at their stadium. Uh, you know, I mean that that should just be a, pretty much a, a given. You know, because uh, Tennessee just historically has just played badly against the Gators. Like even when they're actually not that terrible of a team, whenever they go to play the Gators, it's just like they freak out, they freeze or something, and just Tennessee, Tennessees. You know, and then the Gators just dominate. Uh, and I, I do believe that that's going to be more of a trend going forward. Um, as far as this game goes, I don't think it's necessarily a domination game because, you know, I mean, uh, of, and, and, but it really depends on, it really depends on Milton. How good is Milton? That, that really is the, the big factor, you know. Um, if he goes in there and he plays like, you know, Hendon Hooker, it, yeah, it'll definitely be a close game. It'll be a back and forth like what we had uh, last year, but it's a swamp. So, you know, I mean, home field advantage, obviously, you know, I mean, they're going to be fired up. They're going to be ready to go. And I mean, um, is that, is that a night game? It yes. should be right. Yeah. So yeah. if it's a, if it's a night, yeah. I mean, the Gators, you know, I mean, we go hard at night. Uh, so I think that that's going to be, you know, one of the deciding factors. If he's, you know, I mean, ass like, you know, I mean, Dustin says, you know, in the chat, then that's going to be something to where, yeah, we are going to come in. And I do believe that we're going to win uh, by a few oh, touchdowns if our on. offense is clicking. I forgot that Joe Milton, he doesn't lose at in Florida, though. Oh, <laughs> we forgot about that, though, Aaron. I wonder, I wonder if Peyton Manning said the same thing. <laughs> Oh man. Oh, that's funny. That's a good point though. I don't know. Did he? He he may have. I don't know. Man. Peyton Manning never beat us. Ne I never can't beat wait us. Until period. every single person in the state of Florida who's a Gator fan is repeating that over and over again. He's gonna see it as he's driving his or he's riding that bus and it's just gonna be plastered. There's gonna be planes flying it in those banners. It is just gonna be like Joe Milton doesn't lose in Florida. They better not lose in Florida. He will never live it down. I can't wait to do that show. I cannot wait to do that show. Yeah, and if he sucks it up, you can expect that our defense is definitely going to take advantage. <laughs> I am so excited uh, for our defense uh, this, this season under Austin Armstrong. I mean, it is just scary already. And we're not even going forward into 2024 yet with, you know, the best defensive line class. Uh, that, you know, I mean, is to be had right now in 2024, but we'll, we'll kind of mm -hmm. jump on that in a minute. But even still, I do think that you're going to see a massive, um, a massive uh, improvement to the defense. And I think that's going to make a, a big statement as well. Because remember, when we were going back and forth, 
you know, last year. It was just a shootout game against, you know, I mean, just bad defense and bad defense, really just a high-scoring shootout game. And I don't think you'll see that this year. I think you're going to see a more aggressive defense uh, on the Florida side. And I think that we take advantage. And if Marks can just manage the game, we can get our run game going, finally get past the freaking stacked box for the love of God. You know, I mean, with uh, the things that we've been doing to have a better offense uh, that, you know, I mean, we'll kind of talk about a little bit more with, you know, running backs lining up in the spot and, you know, I mean, with new wide receivers, I mean, tight ends over the middle, et cetera. I think that that's going to be a, a major uh, deciding factor there. If we can get things clicking, I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to beat them by at least two touchdowns. But even if we aren't playing our best football, I think with just the uh, improvements alone on offense and defense, uh, I still think that we come away with that win, you know, and I believe that that 51% probably changes a little bit higher, uh, especially towards uh, the end of the game where we start to maybe yeah. run away with it a little bit more by the end of the I, game. I mean, obviously this, this 51% is not 51% if we're playing in Neyland. And I, I mean, I'll be the first one to admit that Neyland is one of the few uh, major advantage home field advantages. Um, it's a, it's a trash can. Don't get me wrong, but it's a loud trash can. Neyland stadium is a loud trash. It's like, it's more like a dumpster. It's a, it's a huge dumpster, but, um, but the swamp is also one of those incredibly large advantages in the home field, especially at night. And I look forward to watching those Tennessee volunteers come back to the swamp and having to reconcile with what should be a very, very motivated Gator team and fan base. Who's ready to eat, especially if we're in there two and oh. And ranked, at yeah, that point, right. I was just so, getting ready to say, especially if we're two and zero and we're fired up after that. Yeah, we're we're definitely going to be coming out strong. But even if we're not two and zero, if we're one and one, that with a with an opportunity to beat a two and zero Tennessee team, you know, it, it's it, that could be fun. That could be a lot of fun. And um, it'll although, it'll just be kind of a chip on the shoulder revenge type game. Absolutely. Exactly. All right, so let's move on. All right, Charlotte. Obviously, I mean, this is the last year we get cupcakes, so enjoy it, everybody. Like, yeah. we get McNeese and Charlotte because next year it's Miami, UCF, and um, we ha- we get one cupcake, and then Miami, UCF, and uh, and Florida State is, That's our, two. is our cupcakes. Those are our cupcakes. <laughs> it's not our cupcakes, but nevertheless, they're they're it's not the same, um, you know. So, all right, Kentucky. Now, last week, I don't I don't know if you watched the show or not, uh, um, Aaron, but last week. I, I really hammered my brother Brett for telling us that we were going to beat. Uh, he was like, "We're going to lose to Kentucky, but we're going to beat Tennessee." He literally said, "We're going to beat Tennessee," and, and I was like, "I cannot believe you would um, even remotely say that." But I'll give him props because this came out afterwards. This is the updated one, but we're actually expected to lose to Kentucky at Kentucky, um, and ex- we're expected to beat Tennessee. And I, I did not anticipate us being underdogs on that on this level. I mean, like it's it's. It's a pretty drastic difference. I mean, three percent difference is, is to me is a pretty big difference here. Uh, I don't, I don't understand that why we would be, why I mean, like, how can we be a one percent difference here? And there's another one percent difference you're going to see in a second too. Uh, but Kentucky, forty eight percent, man. Like, I just don't understand what is this Kentucky team? Like, are we that far behind Kentucky? Aaron, no. what the heck? No, no. no. <laughs> And again, this is where it comes in that there's the the expectations from the two different years. So, you know, with Kentucky, you know, I mean, you have the the new transfer quarterback. I think they got uh, Devin Leary, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, And then you also have, but I believe they lost Kavasia Smoke. I mean, who, you know, I mean, he he did kind of run all all over us last year. Dustin, I'll get to that in a minute. Continue, Aaron. But, you know, I mean, you got to remember Kentucky beat us – and I hate to say this, and I'm probably going to get some flag for it, but Kentucky beat us because of Richardson. Kentucky had a strategy. They're like, okay, well, this Richardson kid, you know, he's pretty good on the ground, running, scrambling, you know, I mean, and things like that. Um, But what if we stack the box? What if, you know, I mean, we, uh, you know, just lock down the receivers and make him throw it? And obviously with Richardson, he couldn't get around it. And that's one of the reasons why we lost, other than the defense, why we lost so many games last year that we should have won. And uh, why that USF game, you know, was also close in general. They figured out that if they just stacked the box on us, put a scout on Richardson, 
there's nothing that, you know, we can do because he couldn't hit a slant. He, he couldn't hit a screen pass. He, he couldn't read a defense to save his life. And he couldn't figure out when to take off, when to, you know, I mean, when to hold on to the ball, when to, you know, uh, when to let somebody else, you know, I mean, take the ball and run with it. Uh, that was just kind of the whole situation. And basically that was what Stoops was talking about when they, when he was interviewed and he was like, we've got a strategy for him. When we were up yeah. high and mighty and thinking, yeah, there's no possible way. All he figured out was, hmm, if we just stack the box and make this unproven quarterback throw, I bet you we can beat them. And they've got a pretty strong defense. Kentucky's always going to be a strong defense, you know, team. That's, that's this the one. ball that they play. This one uh, yep. so, so it's going to be a low scoring game as it usually is, just to be honest with you. But we didn't lose to Kentucky for 32 freaking years, you know? And I mean, and then all of a sudden we started, you know, losing to Kentucky. We should have won last year, but Richardson, and I don't know if you saw, you know, I mean, his Colts debut through the exact same pass. He threw it directly to the defensive back that's just sitting there, not even anywhere near one of their receivers, and just throws it straight to him, and he runs it back for well, exactly, you know, exactly, ex- exactly right. I mean, there were atrocious throws and impossible. How do you lose that game? Well, he made some really, really bad plays, and look. You know, you got to play with what you're dealt. We didn't have another quarterback. That was it. It was our only. And and I'm gonna defend. I'm gonna defend Napier a little bit here too. Is that you can't just run Richardson when you don't have a backup quarterback. You can't. Right. That was when Jack Miller had. Obviously, he came in as a transfer. He was our backup quarterback, right? And yep. he had a broken hand, a broken thumb, or whatever it was, right? So now you got a at the time Jalen Kitna. Obviously, we know that uh, what all went down afterwards, uh, right? But, time he was our only backup quarterback the only other person on the roster was a walk-on and there was no other option and if Anthony Richardson went down now you have Jalen Kitna and now the backup quarterback is truly a walk-on and you are literally a season of walk-on quarterback is your starting quarterback and walk-on quarterback is your backup quarterback and your walk-on quarterback is your backup backup quarterback. I mean, that's that's literally the position they were in. So you can't just run Anthony Richardson all the time, all the time, but let alone, you know, you have a guy who who was really terrible at reading defenses anyways. But uh, Anthony Richardson threw a lot of really unnecessary balls, and we were up 16-3. to three. I know that Billy Napier, he, he doesn't have a lot of hair, but if he had hair, it would have been on the ground that game. I mean, period. Mm-hmm. And we were up 16-3, to three and, and someone said in the chat, we should not have lost that game. That game was over. That game was over. Yeah, over. I mean, yeah, we, pretty much we, all we had to do was just we just had to maintain what we were doing. The problem was is that they kept stacking the box and we weren't getting anything, uh, you know, running the ball. That was a big issue, you know. Uh, but if all he had to do was just basically do what you know a low level quarterback could do, just hit a couple of screens on the outside when you know they stack the box. You know, dump it off, you know, I mean, just uh, whenever you whenever you need to just dump it off, uh, just have, you know, somebody uh, even in in the in the damn backfield, you know, to dump it off to. I mean, you you don't have to try to, you know, I mean, hit the receivers, you know, for for the long ball. You don't have to necessarily, uh, you know, I mean, throw it in really tight situations or anything like that. And. Truth be told, man. I mean, you've got, dude. You're two. You're two hundred something pounds. You're a monster. Two hundred forty-five pounds. Two forty-five. You're a monster, dude. You can literally. You got one scout against you that probably weighs about, you know, I mean, a, like one hundred eighty pounds. You know, I mean, they don't get a lot of size. Uh, you know, I mean, on their defense, you could run his ass over if you absolutely needed to. But obviously, you know, that's, again, another conversation for another time. I think that Richardson, a lot of times, was just playing it real safe at that point, just trying to trying to not get injured because the guy was made of class. Hold but on. I mean, that, hold, that, on. Uh, hold on. I, 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 would like to, I would like to address this. Thomas, Thomas, I don't know if you understand the, the, the point here. This is what I'm saying is that throughout the season, Anthony Richardson could not just run the ball nonstop up the middle whenever he wanted to because Napier was limited in what was behind Anthony Richardson. This is not to say that we lost the Kentucky game because not having enough quarterbacks was the problem. 
It was a epidemic that plagued the Gators from the beginning of the season to the end of the season and how you could game plan. Okay. If this does not make sense to you, or if you think this is an excuse that does not make sense, you can call it an excuse, but if this does not make sense to you, it does not resonate any, any, any comprehensible method at all that does not resonate in, in any lick of understanding Then we are not talking about the same game period. And it's best that we do not further this discussion. If you cannot find any rationale in there. Anyways, if there is, come on on here. I'll send you a link. Come in here. We can have this discussion together. I'd love to debate you. I'd love it. I don't think you're ready for that. All right, go ahead. And just to piggyback off of that, you know, I mean, um, I do want to say that with Richardson, you know, many times, Napier actually had to dumb down the playbook. You know, I mean, he had to uh, make it to where he did it. You know, he wasn't able to really bring out the plays that he wanted to bring out because, Everybody praises Richardson for just being this amazing athlete. And he is. He's an incredible athlete, dunking from the free throw line, doing backflips on the field, you know, I mean, just about, you know, four or five feet in the air. And, and, you know, obviously the guy can run. I mean, yes, he's an athlete, no doubt about it. I don't question that. The problem is, is that Richardson was doesn't really have that high of a QB IQ. So he's not able to really read the defense as well. He wasn't able to really take in um, a lot of uh, complicated offensive plays. Um, and, and that was really one of the, another big thing. And to your point, you know, uh, you know, Joe, when you said that, you know, Richardson should have been, you know, maybe a little bit lower. I, I kind of, I kind of agree with you. What we needed was we needed we did need a little bit better quarterback as far as this more accurate, more consistent, and then you can bring Richard in on some wildcat situations. That would have been a major major difference in the game. But you know he was just not made to be a starting quarterback uh, with you know the way that we were running our offense at the time. I just don't believe that he was able to really take all of the information, take, you know, all the things that he should do and know as a quarterback uh, and really just put it to the test with the Gators. I I think that there was just a lot of, you know, Richardson, uh, go figure out what you want to do because he could not understand the playbook well and he could not read the defense well. All right, so Thomas, I saw that you said you're ready. Let us get through the rest of this into the Georgia game, and then we'll bring you on at the very end because we have some recruiting things I want to talk about too. But I'm, if you want to get on, man, I would love to do that. You come on whether you get on camera or not. You can you can leave it blank. So uh, uh, just so you know, uh, as long as you're cool with that, Aaron. Um, I don't know how much time you have, but I definitely got. I got all the time in the world, man. Let's do it. Okay, so let's move on past Kentucky. Um, obviously, we're both frustrated that both we both believe that that was a game that we should have won. So we're going to consider a Kentucky. That is a game we should have won last year that we believe that, especially a game if we stay level-headed. Tennessee is a game that we can win this year. I'm not saying it was a game that we should have won last year. I think you'll agree with that too. Tennessee, I think, was the better team last year. Um, at Neyland, they were inspired. Had their quarterback, Hendon Hooker, was a fantastic, you know, I mean, 25-year-old quarterback. I thought he did great, you know, not, not throwing yeah. a shot in there or anything, but. Anyways, all and right. I think with a more accurate quarterback, I think that we're going to come away with a win and a stronger defense as well. I think that's going to make the difference is they won't be able to just stack the box. We'll have a, a little bit more complicated offense, a little bit more dynamic offense, and a much more accurate quarterback that you won't be able to just, hey, we're going to go stack the box and win this game. That's not going to happen anymore. So Gators are going to win that game. It is going to be a fairly low-scoring game like it normally is versus Kentucky, but I do believe that we're going to come away with a win there as well. Absolutely. All right. Moving on. Vanderbilt. I mean, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on this. Feel free. I'll give you Vanderbilt completely uh, outside (laughs) of the fact that we shouldn't have lost to them. I'm ashamed that we have to even mention it, but it's yours. They beat Kentucky too. I mean, everybody kind of gives a shit for it, but to be honest, they did beat Kentucky too. Vanderbilt, you know, I mean, over the years, they've kind of been, you know, uh, just one of those pushover teams. I do think they are actually getting better. That does not mean that they're, you know, getting to the top of the SEC at all by any means or even really uh, to the mid-level. But I do believe they are getting a little bit better and they might be like a Missouri and kind of catch some teams, you know, off guard and they might actually win win a couple games. 
by doing right. so. All right, let's go backwards real quick. That's a that's a I don't know if you can see on the screen. Dustin asked for some score predictions. You want to go backwards and 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 catch up on some score predictions real quick? I, I didn't Ooh, come prepared. Yeah, sure. But, sure, we um, can do that. Let's go backwards and catch him up. I, I'll, I'll come off the fly. Maybe we'll, next time we'll get a little bit. We can, as long as Dustin, you agree, and everybody else in the chat, we're not going to be held to these. We can do a closer score predictions in the future. Utah game off the cuff score prediction. Off the cuff score prediction. I'm going to say. I'm going to say it's not really going to be that close. Um, no matter who plays, so I'm going to say just like. 34, I want to say like 34 to 20, let's we'll say 34 to 21. I'll yeah. say 34 to 21. I'm already on record. I think we win 30 to 13 and we score a defensive touchdown and we get a pick, either pick six or, you know, fumble recovery. And I also think we set up ourselves like a, on a, you know, fumble recovery on the like three or something like that. All right. McNeese, I'm not even going to waste my time. You know, that should be a pretty big score. All right. Florida versus Tennessee. Florida versus Tennessee, I do believe it's going to be a little bit closer. Um, I, I, but I believe that the defense is going to make a difference there. Um, I don't think you score quite as much. We'll say, I'm going to say just off the cuff, okay? So nobody, yeah. you know, come and tag me. I'm going to say that this one's going to be a little bit closer. And I am going to say that this is going to be more of like a, um, we're going to say about 30 to, I'm going to say 30, I'm going to say 30 to 24. I'm going 21, 20. And Tennessee missed another, they missed another field goal for us to win. That's what I'm calling. I think you face a little bit stronger defense with Tennessee. It's not going to be really strong, but I think that, you know, we're going to get the edge on there, um, especially if, you know, Milton is not, you know, who people think he is. I think that it's it's not a hen and hooker type game. I do believe we're going to come away with the win, but I do believe they're going to, I think we're going to pull away a little bit. And then I think they're going to kind of maybe score one last late garbage time touchdown or something Fair like enough. that. All right. Florida, Kentucky. Florida, Kentucky is going to be a low scoring game. Um, so I'm going to say, we're going to say 23 to 14 is what I would say. Mm, okay. I, I'm on, I'm on the same page with you. Um, it'd be hard to go. Andrew ahead. said 24, 14. So pretty, pretty darn close. Yeah. yeah 23. I, I, Almost identical where I was at. I'm gonna just mm -hmm. I, I would have almost probably said the identical score just to say something different. I'm gonna say twenty two to eighteen. I mean, like that's where I'm at, you know. Okay, I, like I'm going sixty to ten. We're we got some revenge here. I mean, I'm just being an ass here. No, I got you. Napier's probably gonna go for two or, <laughs> you, know, or um, you know, we're gonna get a safety somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. By all means, <laughs> Vanderbilt deserves to feel excited about that win and they should and Napier can't be mad at him, but I just I mean it can't be close. Prediction? Oh with Vandy. Okay, so with Vandy, I don't think I don't think it's close this year. I don't okay. I don't think it's close at all. Um I think we're going to, I mean, Vanderbilt, Vandy always has a fairly strong defense. Um, so, but I Start still out. don't think it's close. I'm going to say like, I'm going to say like 30 to 30 to 13, maybe, maybe even higher, maybe 38, 13. I, it's not even, it's not really close. I agree. It's, it shouldn't be. And, you know, okay. So this was, this is my, like, this is my big, like, you know, potential i've always said that south carolina scares me because we beat we beat them pretty bad last year and we have gator fans have overlooked them this year because we beat them last year this is the one game we're not talking about in a lot of ways so um i believe that south carolina is the one game that because we beat them handedly last year we're at south carolina they remember that game the same way we remember the kentucky game right they believe that they have a good team beamer has inspired their fan base they they you know spencer rattler had a lot of hype coming out of uh, high school, you know, has moments of brilliance, has played well at South Carolina. This to me is the one game everybody overlooks 
we're not overlooking Arkansas, I guess, because of the blackout game, but we're overlooking South Carolina at South Carolina. I, I worry about this game. To me, this is is this is the one game that we could we could end up losing like we lost Kentucky, you know. So, anyways, here we go. I I worry about this game. I could see us losing this game. I, I could I could see it if if Rattler is coming out and you know I mean if if Beaver has you know some kind of offensive formula that our defense just for whatever reason cannot stop. Um, the one thing about South Carolina is that their their run defense is garbage. Their run defense is absolute garbage. We ran it down their throats last year. There was nothing they could do. That's why even if they stacked the box on us, it did nothing. That's why we beat them 38-6 to because we've got such a great uh, tandem running back team. Um, now, you know, it, it, this, is a, this is a coin flip, to be honest with you. This is a coin flip, and it, I think it really depends on, you know, how well we've done – uh, in the year as well. I think that if our offense is still moving strong, you know, I mean, we have everybody still fairly healthy. I do believe this is, you know, a winnable game. I really do. But where it can get away from you is, you know, I mean, if if you have Rattler uh, to where, you know, I mean, he's, he's spreading, he's spreading it all over the field, you know, he's, and we're just not able to keep up with that then I think that's where the game gets away from you. And I think that's where, you know, we lose uh, that game at South Carolina. So it's, it's a coin flip for me, honestly. Um, but I really think that our run, our run game is going to be the, the major factor. If, if our offensive line can hold up well and our run game can continue to get going and we can just get some success at defense, we win this game. If our defense buckles and is not able to, you know, I mean, just uh, deal with, you know, a veteran Rattler that's just continually spreading the ball, you know, like I said, all over the field, um, and we're just, for whatever reason, not able to stop it, I think that that's where, you know, I mean, that's where they're going to win the game. This is a coin flip game. Um, I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. I don't think it's going to be a low-scoring game. Uh, so I do believe that this is going to be more of like a shootout type thing, but more on the run uh, and then more on th- with them, you know, less on the run and more actually through the passing game. I'd say with this game, it's going to be super close and it's going to be high scoring. So I say with this game, it's going to be like a 38, 35 somewhere, one way or the other. It's going to be close. Yeah, I, I think that you probably just nailed your synopsis is probably about as close to mine as, as we're going to have it out of all of these is that I feel very, very similar to what you just said, Aaron. This is the closest, the closest to this game and this rivalry, if you want to call it, that is going to be like South Carolina hasn't been anything since Spurrier left. And, you know, unfortunately for, for South Carolina, because South Carolina has got an incredible fan base. I mean, even when they were like bad, they still sold out their stadium Every single game. In fact, I think, and it still may be true, they for a long time, even when they were like one in like nine or one in ten or whatever it was, they had the longest running sellout streak in all of college football. All of college football. I mean, that includes Alabama, that includes Ohio State, that includes USC, or back in the day when they used to care. I mean, we're talking about all the blue bloods. South Carolina, like pre Lou Holtz, that's how far back that thing went, you know, back in the day. So that's that that fan base cared. Clemson has had success in that state, uh, clearly. And, you know, for all the things that, you know, you would think that 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 program should be compared to what Clemson has been able to accomplish, they have not been able to to sustain that success the way that Spurrier set them up to. So I say that to say this, is that South Carolina, this is the closest that this this rivalry is going to be for a very long time. So from here on out, Napier owns it. Going forward, yeah, this is the last year that this this game. Now, I'm not saying this is the last year they're ever going to beat them if they if they beat us this year, but going forward, it won't be close anymore. Uh, no, but, I think after Rattler's gone, I think it's it's going to be a, a whole different ball game. To be honest with you, so I do see you know I mean South Carolina potentially giving us our first, possibly our second loss of the season here. Yeah, um, but ultimately speaking, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to predict a Gators win. Although I fear that this could be potentially the one game before um, the Georgia game that we could, we could potentially end up losing. However, I'm going to predict the Gators win because we shouldn't lose this game. Clearly we dominated them last year. They're just going to be fired up. Like, 
we are about the Kentucky game because we ain't forgetting. If they've got no answer to if they got no answer to, to Montreal, if they've got no answer to, e, to ETN, possibly even I doubt we get we throw Webb in there, but you know I mean either way, because um, it was originally supposed to be Curl, but you know oh, yeah. obviously he got I hate injured that form too. Obviously I know, but anyway, but either way, if we get you know the, the three headed monster going, or even if we just get you know uh, the running tandem of, of of Johnson and ETN, and we're just slamming them, slamming them, slamming them, slamming them, and they got no way to stop it, we win that game. Yeah. I mean, it should not be a game we lose, but I still – it's it's the one game on the schedule that I could see us overlooking because what's next? You know, what's what's happening? Where, where, where are we at? Here we go. Big, bad, mean Georgia. Oh, man, these losers. All right. So earlier I had a, I think it was Dustin who asked me um, who, who, who my least favorite rival is. Let me tell you, it's actually not Georgia, Georgia. And I explained this before I'm, I'm 38 years old, Georgia. And I mean, I was talking to Aaron about this the other day. I didn't grow up. I grew up in the nineties. I was, I was born in the eighties. I grew up in the nineties. I started watching Gator football religiously late nineties, where I really started paying attention when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. Steve Spurrier into the Ron Zook era when I was probably 15, 16 or Meyer took over when I was uh, in, in like starting my college years, um, sophomore, I think when he took over along the short is this, is that Georgia was not good. They just were not a rival. They were, they were getting their ass kicked every year by us. Steve yep. Spurrier made them our little puppy dogs. Hey, little puppy dogs. Hey, look, y'all want to come over and get beat today? That's what you're going to do. That's what Steve Spurrier made them. They did not hold a place in the rivalry. Philip Fulmer and, you know, Bobby Bowden, those were the two people I hated. So to this day, even though we, we, we didn't make Tennessee much better, I still hate Tennessee more than I hate Georgia. I really do. I can't stand a Tennessee trash can volunteer. But they are – far more in my heart. Like like right now, Georgia obviously has the dominant team and I respect them as a dominant, but I don't even hate Tennessee more than, I mean, I can't stand Florida state. I mean, I, I just, I hope, but I respect the rivalries enough to appreciate that we want them to exist and that we need to lose back and forth for them to matter. Right? Like I don't want to lose very often, but they do need to go back and forth for them to now I'm starting to appreciate the Georgia rivalry more. Right? Like my kids will be like, they're going to be like Florida state. Why do we don't, I mean, like they're terrible. Like, so, I mean, who knows? Yeah. I mean, with Georgia, it, I kind of agree with you there. I mean, Georgia is one of those teams that obviously we don't like them. Your we, perspective is a little bit different. You no, know, just listen. I mean, so it's one of those teams that we don't like them. I mean, I can't stand Georgia. Don't get that twisted at all. But Georgia, to me, is kind of like, you know, that – and it's only because of age, because they've been around longer, obviously, um, or, I mean, well, or they – well, I guess we've been around similar time. Well, yeah, we're, we're not that far different in age. We're, we're, so we're not that far different. The way I look at it is, you know, I mean, with, with Georgia, it's, it's kind of like – kind of like our our brother in a sense you know i mean it's like we're both in the sec you know and it's one of those things that's like you know obviously when we're winning we're like you know we're, we're sticking it to them and everything like that i mean right now unfortunately they you know they have the rivalry and you don't want to see them win at all but at the end of the day you know i mean if it's if it's georgia versus florida state I'm re I'm I'm going Georgia just because it's SEC and because it's it's Florida State. You know, I mean, no, but I I I root against Florida State every single possible chance that I possibly get. Don't get me wrong, I do it for Georgia too. Um, but you know, I mean, it's it's just one of those things. There's a little bit more of a mutual respect between Florida and Georgia than there is Florida and Florida State. Just uh, yeah, a little. I bit. mean, I. You know, a little bit. I I would say that, but man, Georgia fans really hate Florida. Like they're just okay. I'm sorry, but Georgia fans they don't okay. I, if you can go on record with for me on this. I mean, then they can get mad at me all day for this. The majority, the majority of Georgia fans 
do not understand football at all, nor do they understand any other type of sport. All they know is it is. That's all they know. <laughs> that is literally all they know. They don't know anything about it. You try to talk strategy with them. You try to talk scheme with them. You try to talk stats, anything like that. Kirby Smart, go dogs. Yeah, Kirby Smart, you know, uh, stats and bit, uh, two-time national champion. You know, I mean, that's all they know. And in regards to, you know, I mean, this game, I do believe that with the talent gap that there is, and we saw it last year, I do believe with the talent gap that there still is, and Napier's working on that, even though Carson Beck so far has struggled and Georgia's quarterback room has struggled because I don't believe that they can really develop talent very well uh, on, you know, the offensive side, especially on, on QB. Um, then I think even though, even if Carson Beck comes out and he's really not that great of a quarterback, you still got Bowers, man. That guy is just yeah. unreal. I have to give respect to that dude because he's unreal, he's man. He's and he's going to make the big A. Yeah, he's, he's, he's another Gronk. He's yeah. another Kelsey. He's just going to make a huge name for himself. I mean, there's just no question. But at the end of the day, you know, even if their offense isn't, you know, the greatest offense, they're still going to have a very, very good defense. They've still been recruiting at a very high level for longer than we have. Even if it's a few years, it's going to show on the field. Even if we're stronger on defense, you know, I mean, the only possible way that you can win this game, like as, as a Florida fan, it, it's going to be grueling. It's going to be, you know, I mean, those really tough situations where, you know, you're running the ball, maybe two, three yards, maybe you get – a little, you know, I mean, pass to the outside, but it's going to be a struggle over and over and over again, every down, and it's going to be a grueling game. If you win, it's going to not be by very much, and it's going to be a defensive standoff like you've never seen. If our defense can hold against, you know, I mean, a, a not very good Carson Beck, but, you know, a very good, obviously, Brock Bowers, and if they can actually hold against this defense, which is, you know, I mean, uh, which, which is uh, outstanding defense, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. That's the only way you're going to win, and it's going to be a defensive battle. I don't see, unfortunately, because of the talent gap, us winning this game just yet. It's coming, it would be an awesome. um, but unless our defense really shows out and Beck, you know, just does like a little – uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, Beck has it to where it's, you know, the 2020 uh, game to where, you know, I mean, we, we won that because uh, we were getting to Bennett. He was getting all flustered. He was throwing picks, fumbles, everything like that. That's the way that we can win that game if our defense can hold that strong. But I just don't see it happening quite yet. That's all I'm going to say. So, so look, I think, I think it, you just – I think you hit every main point here. Um, this is this is my my counter. Now, I there's no doubt this is not our year to, that we should be competing with Georgia. This is not the year. Mm -mm. However, the Austin Armstrong effect is to be determined. I'll never forget that transition that we saw both from uh, Nick Saban from year one losing to Louisiana Tech to year two and getting Alabama from from losing to Louisiana Tech to Number one in the country at one point. Yes, they did end up losing to us, the Gators, in the SEC championship game. So still a good game. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, Florida was still a better team. And that might be where we're at facing Georgia in that, you know, in that game. Um, but also what did how did Kirby look in year two of um uh, of that of that Georgia team? They lost to Vanderbilt in that first year uh with with Kirby at, at Georgia. And right. Then, you know, he had a drastic overhaul and a drastic change in how that team looked. Now, they didn't go off and start winning the national championship next year, you know, but I don't even know if they, were, did they win the, the SEC East? No, I think, I think Dan Mullen was in that actually, or maybe it was, uh, it might have been McElwain actually. I can't remember. I like, what was, was it 2015 or 2016 that, that Kirby took over? He's been there seven years now. I know that. You do the math. I'm terrible at it. I want to say it was 2016, but I could be wrong. Nevertheless, Kirby had a immediate overhaul 
and still took him a year. He had the number one or number two class come in Georgia, still took him a whole year for that transition. Napier is going to have a similar transitional year. We saw that this second year, man, that, that system, Austin Armstrong, I think is Kirby 2.0 on defense. And we'll see if he can, if he can really switch up his, his play calling that time management that everybody gave him shit for last year. I'm excited to know and see what happens this season. I think that Billy's excited about this year. You can see it in his confidence. You can see it in the way that he holds back saying certain things. He's a very, very humble guy too. He doesn't go out bragging. That's the one thing I miss about Spurrier though, man. He called plays like he talked to reporters. Bold and cocky, man. He wasn't scared of nothing. And I'm going right. to tell you right now, that's the one thing that the Gators, that swagger, that, that's the Gators, that's the Gator swagger. And I'm hoping that Billy opens up that playbook a little bit the same way he opens up talking to reporters once with a little bit of success. But we got to get there first. And so with a little bit of success, maybe we'll see that. I'm calling it that we will see a close game against Georgia. Do we win it? Probably not. You're probably right. But it wouldn't surprise me if that game came down to a field goal. And if we missed it or if we made it, we're in the game. That's where I'm. That's where I see it. We're in I the game. So. As long Aaron, as you can protect the ball. We're in the game. Mm-hmm. And there is not a Gator fan that won't leave Jacksonville in that stadium if we're in the game in the fourth quarter. That won't leave there disappointed if we lose. Absolutely. But with some confidence going into the rest of the season and next year. But most importantly, remember this. We go in there 6-1, and 7-0. and zero, those, That team will have confidence that they can win. I guarantee you. And if that team feels like they can win, anything can happen at that point. I agree. I believe it's going to be a really, I mean, it's going to be, if we lose, it's going to be by a touchdown, maybe 10 at most. You know, I I don't think it's going to be one of nobody, you know, I mean, just completely destroys the Gators. I mean, in in regular season, obviously, I mean, a bowl game, that's a different deal because we have so many opt outs and people want to talk crap about that, but they just don't get that everybody's pretty much gone. Nobody gives a shit at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I oh, Go ahead. What did uh, you want to say? I actually accidentally took that down. He said, answer me one question before you make. Thomas left. I guess he just, he said, yeah, I'm down. Am I missing that? Did, did he go anywhere, by the way? Oh, I have no idea. Um, I saw Thomas a little bit ago, but I haven't really. Well, he said he was ready. I invited him to come on at the end of the show. And if he wanted to hop on, but I, he, he hasn't, I guess he left after that. Um. Oh, he's here. Okay. 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 Well, I I said get ready, Thomas. All right. Oh, so, okay. Let's go, Thomas. Okay. I, I want to hear Thomas. some opposing viewpoints. So, Thomas, I'm. I need you to send. I need you to click on the the swamp. You might have to go to the actual Facebook page. I'm going to send you a link. You're going to send. You're going to send Swamp News a Facebook message, and then I'm going to send you the link, uh, to the show. Okay. So you're going to message the Facebook page, and then I'm going to send you the link to join. All right. Cause I got my, I got the Facebook page, um, the messages up. So you just need to message the page so I can send you the link. Let me know. I'll be waiting on that. Hopefully that makes well, sense. To him. All right. Go ahead, Darren. Go while ahead. you're waiting on that. I just want to, I, I just also want to talk about, you know, I mean, with you, you kind of touched on a little bit with, with Napier and, you know, I mean, his first year, everyone sitting there, you know, I mean, bitching is like, Oh, you know, we went, we went six and six. It's like, we went to a bowl the, the you know the the first year under uh, a new coach it, and I don't think re- people realize how bad of a situation like Mullen left behind. I mean, he le- he left the program in shambles and we we nearly imploded. Like Napier was Napier's the one to bring it back. Napier's the one that's going to be able to get all that, you know, cancer that cancerous shit out of out of the locker room. And Napier is going to just rebuild. He's already rebuilt the foundation. Now he's getting his pieces into place. Now he's getting the plays that he wants to be able to, you know, have called because he's going to have more of a competent, uh, consistent, accurate, you know, quarterback. And that is where you're going to see Florida really begin to show uh, what they're made of. But you can't sit there and judge the guy off of one year just because, you know, he he wasn't able to, you know, take us to – you know, I mean, the, the, the SEC championship or, you know, the national championship, that's that's ridiculous. And I think some of the Gator fans, you know, I mean, need to temper their expectations a little bit because, you know, we could have 
we could have easily gone, you know, I mean, uh, five and seven or what have you, even with the talent that we had, because there was, there was just a, a brand new system being put into place, a new coach that they didn't commit to uh, most of the players. And I, th I think that, you know, I mean, being able to at least have that, that bowl game uh, really, you know, made a difference. And I do honestly think that it, it helped in the recruiting uh, to be able to give a little bit more belief. Cause I believe if we bomb that season, then we wouldn't have been able to recruit so well uh, for the 2024 season, which I'd love to talk with you in a little bit, because I am very excited about the 2024 season and uh, the yeah, recruiting absolutely. class that follows. Absolutely. No, that goes without saying. All right. So I, I do need to make an announcement, everybody. I thought Thomas Smith was going to join us tonight because he said I'm ready and he can't because he's working. So there was a miscommunication there, everybody. So if you were excited about Thomas Smith coming on, as I understood it, um, officially that's not going to happen tonight. So, um, I mean, it is what it is. Maybe next time. Right. Thomas. All right. Um, so Aaron, uh, I think some good points again, we could, we could definitely hop onto that subject next. Uh, let's go ahead and make a non-official prediction that we can actually make an official one next time we, uh, have our official preseason, uh, because we'll do one right before the season to actually give. We'll actually spend our time, write down our official predictions and hold each other accountable for the whole season for that one. But, that sounds Georgia, fun. Georgia score, unofficial Georgia score prediction. Ooh, ooh, unofficial Georgia score prediction. Ooh, okay. remember your dad this might is, watch this. <laughs> I'm just joking. This is going to be a really close game, and it, I feel like it's going to be a really low scoring. Ooh, I'm going to say they're going to hate me for this one, but I'm going to say. Gonna it's, I said they're going to hate me for this okay. one. Everybody okay. out in Gator Nation is going to hate me for this one. But I'm going to say it's going to be – I say Georgia's going to beat us 24-20. to 20. It's going to be really close. I think I mean, it's going to be you, close. You think Pembroke's going to hate you because, because Georgia's going to beat us? I, I think it's just because Georgia's going to beat us, yeah. I think it's going to be fairly close. I think it's going to be a very strong defensive game. Um, it's going to be a – it's going to be a grind, a grind, a grind. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily a coin flip game. I think, you know, I mean, that Georgia is able to just best us with the, the talent gap that we have currently. I do believe that it's still going to be close because I don't believe Carson Beck is as good as Stetson Bennett was, even though people say Stetson Bennett, you know, wasn't that great of a quarterback. And I agree. He did make some great throws. I don't think Beck is, you know, to that point. But I do think that they still have Bowers. They still got some strong running backs. They still got an amazing defense, and I think that that's going to make the difference. And unfortunately, I do believe that we're gonna we're gonna lose that game. We're just not quite there yet, but we will be. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody's gonna be mad at you for that. I think people might be disappointed that we lose that game, but I think the overwhelming majority of Gator Nation is prepared to get beat by Georgia at this point. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, I don't know many Gator fans who think we're going to beat Georgia. Uh, game day, I'll be nice and whiskeyed up and you won't be able to convince me we're going to lose that game after about 9 30 AM. Um, well, depending on what time the game is, honestly, but, um, assuming it's going to be a two 30 game and we're both ranked in the top 10, which hopefully we will be, uh, I, you know, never know what's going to happen, but, um, yeah, but I do think we, at one point we'll lead into the game. Like I'm not, not zero. To right. zero or, I agree. To, I agree a hundred percent. I believe we will lead. Um, you know, probably maybe going into halftime, yep. uh, maybe even into the third quarter. Exactly. But I do believe that just at the very end of the game, I think is where we're just going to get, you know, I mean, handed the, the defense is probably going to be a little bit worn down, you know, I mean, and I, I just believe that, you know, I think we're, we're just going to, unfortunately, I believe that that talent is going to show just a little bit stronger. And I think that they're going to come back and they are going to, they are going to beat us. Just I mean, by a little bit, but I think it'll be like a last minute touchdown. I, I'm going to say this, and I'm not joking when I say this. Look, look, there's something to be said about finding you a 25 year old quarterback who, like, why wouldn't you? Like, there are plenty of of grown men, 25 year old grown men who at 20 are not capable of making the NFL, but at 25 are far more superior developed that are really capable of playing at an elite level at quarterback. Like it's actually a brilliant strategy. And I think, I mean, what are the chances that two 25 year old dudes go out and dominate the sec and, and really play at a high level that were 
unheard of until they're 25. I mean, like that's to me, there's something there. There's something there. When are you at your most elite in the NFL? 25, 28, right? There, I mean, it may not be traditional, but Stetson Bennett, no chance as an 18 year old, no chance as a 20 year old. No, but an elite no. SEC quarterback at 25. Truly, yeah. I mean, the guy made great decisions, mentally mature. I mean, you could say he went out and partied. Well, guess what? So did I when I was 25, 27 years old, you know? And, but at the same time, those mistakes that he made were minimal and he knew how to control himself and be, I, I think there's, I think there's a formula there that we might start seeing more and more. Honestly. And he had great, and he had great talent around him. Let's not forget that. You know, you had, you had, um, you know, I mean, Bowers, you know, you've got, that's what uh, I'm saying. You got a game manager. You got a Greg McElroy, yeah. Aaron, you got an Aaron Murray, Greg McElroy, who literally is smart enough and mature enough now to actually comprehend the offense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Red who, defense as well. He did actually have a fairly high QBIQ. Um, you know, he didn't have necessarily the strongest arm, but he was able to, you know, get it to the guys that he knew were going to make big plays and that's all that was needed for him. And I think if Beck can, you know, I mean, do that, then that's going to be also where, you know, Georgia's offense is going to succeed as well. But and I don't think, I don't think Beck is quite as good. So I do believe that, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to, I, I believe that, you know, I mean, Georgia is going to be more beatable this year. And I don't think that they're going to three P even though they have the easiest schedule I think I've ever seen for an SEC team. Um, oh ever. I mean, it might ever. as well be a, it it's, might as well be a, like a, a big 12 teams. I don't need, I don't even know if it's like, there are big 12 teams with harder schedules than Georgia's. Mm -hmm. We are their hardest. We are their hardest game. I mean, just just bar none. Like we are their hardest game. So I mean, it, as of it, right it, now, I think they have one ranked opponent. Yeah, and it's just it's just ridiculous. But in 2024, guess what? That all changes. No more cupcake. You know, I mean, walks Georgia. I mean, you've actually got to be able to, you know, put your money where your mouth is at that point. And you've actually got to, you know, play to win. You know, at that point. So well, let, let's switch gears real quick. Uh, I want to. Uh, I wanted to go to. I, um, I wanted to switch over to the SEC championship game in 2024. I wanted to, okay. I don't, I don't know. I, and I have not heard what, I mean, and this is also post 2024 too. And, and there's some discussion. I, I do think that Florida state not having made a announcement that they're going to join a different conference probably means that there's a good chance that they might be joining the SEC at some point. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I didn't either, but they could have made an announcement they could have they're either going to stay with the acc or they're going to join the big 12 or the sec because the big 10 had a chance to get them clemson mm -hmm. and i think clemson and, F and fsu are either going to join the sec or the big 12 now it's in their best interest to go join the big 12 right now if you ask me the bobby bowden approach would be go dominate the big 12 and that could keep the big 12 relevant but they would be in the exact same money situation they're in right now with the ACC, and that's what they're trying to avoid. So I think the writing's on the wall at this point, and it was against my better judgment. You could ask me two weeks ago, and I would say no chance that SEC's bringing them in. They would go get Virginia Tech and North Carolina and call it a day, right? But yep. regardless, regardless, regardless if that happens or not, what happens to the SEC championship? Is it now written re irrelevant? Is it in anybody's best interest to go play that game at this point? And yeah, because you have no East they? or West. I mean, at this point, the SEC championship may determine if or even eliminate you from making that even a 14 playoff, potentially, let alone a 12 team playoff. It could potentially eliminate that or or cause you to have an injury or lose, you know, you know, uh, opportunity to to get a better seed, you know have to play Georgia instead, or excuse me, having to play Ohio state rather than having to play Oregon. Right. I mean, now we're talking about seedings or even a, a barrier of, of, of entry, let alone, you know, even getting in, like, why would you even want to play in that game? So what do you think happens to this game? So I think that with them completely doing away with divisions, you know, the East and the West in 2024. Thanks Andrew. Uh, Till next time, brother. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, that is going to be one of the big, you know, 
shocks, the culture shocks, if you will. And I think that that's going to be one of the big deciding factors. So you've got just basically this, this SEC free for all brawl where we're just going to beat each other up over and over and over and over and over again. And I mean, I, to me, the way that the SEC has been going and how strong that we've been and we've got such strong teams, I feel that in the overall aspect of things, when you're talking about, you know, the SEC championship, uh, it does become, you know, I mean, more more pointless, especially when you're bringing in, you know, I mean, the, uh, the 12-team playoff and things like that. And it also, here's one thing that, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't really uh, realize is that if the SEC is continually beating each other up over and over and over and over again, then they're going to have, you know, maybe fairly, you know, lower record. And then you've got to wonder at that point, you know, I mean, if you've got, you know, maybe like a seven and five or you got an eight and four, you got, I don't think anybody's going to be dominant when you're constantly playing strong opponent after strong opponent after strong opponent. And I think that what's going to happen is infinitely that's going to potentially weaken the SEC in, you know, this 12 team playoff. And I think that that's going to be, you know, one of the, one of the big issues. And plus, let's not even talk about injuries depth you know this is where that can potentially weaken the sec as opposed to you know i mean the um what's left of the pac 12 um what's left of the acc everything like that you know i mean and, and i think that that is where you're going to see more conferences that are actually going to be looking like they're better because we're going to have such a beat up uh sec champion uh, at that point and then it's going to be just you know, a little bit healthier against a little bit healthier teams. So to me, the SEC championship game matters less at that point because it's just a massive SEC free for all. And at the end of the day, what matters, who wins that game isn't always going to determine who's going to get in the playoffs and who's not. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, you know, the SEC championship to me is the most irrelevant winning you know, championship for me at this point now than it ever has been. I mean, there's some shit talk, I guess, you know, concept here that, but even now, like the SEC champion has been so successful in the national championship that it, it's not even a regional winner anymore. It's, it's like, it's almost like an embarrassment if you go and represent the SEC and then you go and lose the national championship. Like it's happened to Georgia and Alabama. I think now they've won the SEC championship each and then the, the the other one won the national championship now because Georgia did it first and then Alabama beat them in the championship and then Georgia or Alabama won the Ch SC championship most recently and then Georgia beat them in the national championship. So it's like even then like like that SC championship is is irrelevant to that team at that point, right? I so right. I mean like it's almost irrelevant for them to have played it, in other words. Um, right. long or the short is this is that um I don't see us playing that game anymore. I, I see us all ag agreeing that it is in all of our best interests to allow the the four or five best SC teams to get into that and to eliminate one of them would be only to hurt our conference. And I agree. That, and at that point, you know, um, we'll see. We'll see. We got a lot to we got a lot to figure out, though. That's for sure. Nevertheless, 12 team playoff is going to be as fun as it gets. And we, the Gators, have a lot to look forward to because getting to the playoff is is the goal. It's not to be number one in the country. It's not to be the top four in the country. It's to be the top 12 in the country. And when right. I say top 12, you know, it really is. It could be seven or eight SEC teams. And it's going to be, do you fall into that top 12 ranking? It, it should not be biased. And it doesn't mean, because right now you see it right this very second. There are very biased. multiple times that the, the SEC has benefited from this in many instances where we've had more than one in there. And um, I don't see that changing, bro. And even though we might have three or four teams that have, you know, um, that that have less worse records. I mean, honestly, Alabama should have gotten in with two losses. And if there was a team with two losses last year, it would have been. And TCU has just ruined it for any of those little shitty teams to ever have gotten in again. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I really do that. I really do think that you know. I mean, that really. When when Georgia just absolutely destroyed TCU, I mean, it just showed the absolute dominance of the SEC, to be honest with you. But then you got to ask yourself, um, you know, I mean, like I said, if, if they're just beating each other up over and over and over again, if that really, you know, I mean, changes things. So I don't know if yeah. you remember uh, an old movie, um, real quick, I don't, I don't know if you remember an old movie 
um, you know, gladiator, uh, where, you know, I mean, he was going and he was defeating champion after champion after champion. And then Caesar comes up, you know, I mean, and he's getting ready to fight him and he just, you know, stabs him in the side. That's, that's kind of the way I see, you know, you're going to have this beaten up, bloodied SEC team against, you know, I mean, this so, you know, this so-called, you know, um, Pac-12 champion, you know, Big Ten, Big 12, whatever, you know, and I think that it's going to be a, a much easier schedule for them, less injuries, less death, depth issues, uh, things like that. And then I think that, you know, that's really the way that they're possibly trying to uh, take, not necessarily take down the SEC, but maybe water down the SEC a little bit. Um, and of course, it's just big entertainment for the SEC teams to just destroy each other, you know, I mean, uh, rather than being able to consistently be, you know, national champion over and over again or in the playoffs over and over again. I think that the the point behind it is really just to, you know, have us just beat each other senseless and then take the least beaten down team into, you know, into the playoffs, even if it's, like I said, even if it's, you know, one or two, because again, if you're basing it off of win count, then you're going to have less team, less teams from the SEC in the champ in the in the championship or in the playoffs because of us just beating each other senseless. We're going to have a little bit lower records because it's just dog eat dog out there in the SEC. It's not like you can be a Clemson and just dominate your conference, you know, or or something like that. It, it's just it's it's not the same by any means. Yeah, I mean, th- I understand the argument, but let's take a look at the SEC West, which has has dominated you know, college football uh, as a, as a whole. I mean, like even in like, you know, the years where they have five teams in the top 10 in the, you know, the middle of like the, the heat running into it, you have like LSU, you know, Alabama, you, you got freaking uh, Texas A&M at times you've got, you know, sometimes you got Arkansas, you know, making a run up there with, with Pittman that year. Um, sometimes you got Mississippi state or Ole Miss. I mean, these teams can still put three or four teams in the top 12 or top 15 and all of them towards the end of the season still have a chance. And one or two games is what separates them. And now you got Hugh freeze with Auburn too. I mean, like you're still going to have two or three teams from SEC West that have really strong chances, if not four at times, you know? So I mean, like you're talking about seven, eight teams now, eight teams coming in from there. Texas, I mean, now there's no SC West anymore. So these are the teams right. that like literally think about think about it. How many losses can you have to make the playoff? Right. Well, exactly. if you go look at the top, I mean, you you got no more than three, probably. I mean, more than likely. I mean, if you I, I don't I wish I had the rankings up front of me and, and we could we could have this discussion on the next one that we do because I mean I mean we're at an hour and twenty minutes almost. Um, but I think that the, traditionally speaking, now we're condensing from the power five really to the power three because the ACC is about to to dissolve, right? So the power three, we're, we, we're condensing everything. I mean, it's not like it used to be, right? So we have to put into perspective that the whole world in college football is changing and that's going to adjust. And the top teams are going to be the top teams and everybody else is going to get destroyed too. And you're not going to be a, a you know, Boise state, like it used to be, you don't get to just mm-hmm. run the table. Tulane is not going to make the power. The, you might get one, you might get one, but the rest of them, I mean, it's only going to take a few of them, you know, to go get 63 to seven for them not to be in there anymore. Yeah. Remember, and- they're not going to be the, 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 for the four seed, they're going to be the eight seed playing Alabama or Georgia. And that's mm-hmm. it. You're not going to get to go play OU in the Fiesta Bowl, you know, as the as the number seven versus number, you know, eight. You're going to play number one against number 12. And mm-hmm. you're going to get destroyed, bruh. And you were about That's to meet true. daddy. And <laughs> you were about to get eaten and shit on today. And it's over. Yeah, it will be the best of the best in the SEC, no matter what. Even, I mean, with them constantly expanding, uh, you know, taking in Oklahoma, taking in Texas, it will be the the best of the best no matter what so i want i want to hit dustin's comment and i understand dustin why you're saying this but i don't think that this takes into consideration that the landscape has now put all of these teams in one conference and now they're playing everybody and they're all ranked in the top 25 like that's the difference to me and notre dame gets to play air force and navy and army and boston college and you know ucla 
Like that's the difference to me. But I understand that concept that you're speaking of. I just think it's the quality of team is different. Uh, Aaron, I don't know if you have a comment on that. No, I mean, like I said, it is going to be a, a quality difference, you know, between Clemson that, you know, I mean, let's just say could run the table, you know, I mean, or uh, let's just say um, Ohio State or, you know, whomever, you know, I mean, just runs the table in their conference. And then, like I said, you know, you've got your top dog, you know, SEC team. I really, either way you, you slice it, I think that, you know, I mean, the SEC, the SEC team is still going to win. Now, if we're putting number one against number 12, I mean, if you're talking about like a, um, you know, I mean, Pac-12 he says champion, one for four get buys. I mean, that might be the case. I mean, I guess that might make sense. Yeah. I don't know if that's the case, but yeah, no Pac-12 it, anymore. I haven't, I, I haven't, next year, next year, the world. No <laughs> I haven't dove that far into it. You know, I mean, if one in four, you know, I mean, get buys and that's going to be different. But from what I've seen, you know, I mean, I've seen that, you know, I mean, the, the, the one in 12 seed are going to play. Um, you know, I mean, and, you know, the higher versus the lower from what I've seen. And I mean, that's just where you're going to, you're going to have elimination, you know, you're going to have that TCU versus Georgia, you're going to have that, uh, you know, I mean, that, that lower level, you know, team, that low level man, and they're just going to get absolutely wrecked by an SEC team. Yeah. I mean, 100%. by the numbers, I mean, like you would have, so if you were going to do like a, a sweet 16, you would have to have 16 teams. So it would make sense. And he's right. One through four would have to get buys. And then you would have eight teams that would have an elimination, you know, four versus four teams will play four, four different teams. So I guess five through 12 would play each other and play the four teams. I don't think nobody should have a buy though. I think that's bullshit. Like why would you give the first four teams a buy? That's, that's bullshit. Like that automatically gives the top four teams an extreme advantage when they already have like, I think that's stupid. You got to have 16 teams to me. That's oh, actually ridiculous. It's kind of like what it was in the NFL. You know I mean? When the Jags were going to play the chiefs, the chiefs had a buy while the Jags were, you know, playing. Yeah. But you have 16 games in a lot more fairly where people draft. Like to me, that college football is not that fair. I'm saying from the playoff standpoint, you know, from the, from the number one seed and, you know, the number four seed and everything like that. I don't believe in it either. I don't think anybody should get a buy. I think it should just be, you know, it's straight time, through. Baby. But you should get a buy in regular season. You know, you got to Yeah, let regular you season. Yes, get. everybody should get a buy. That's fine. Yeah. How you, how you get your buy and when you get it, look at the draw, I guess, whatever. But, I mean, Florida gets the buy the same week every single year, and that's fine. Everybody knows it's before Georgia. For Georgia, I would hate that, you know, for us. I mean, it hasn't made a difference lately, but I mean, it is what it is. But during the playoffs, playoffs, you should, nobody should be getting no buys, man. Not in college football. So we kind of we kind of got lost on the on the uh, I think the score predictions once we got past Georgia too. Uh, no, no, we we're, we're done. We're just going to Georgia. So we're just going to Georgia. We're just going to Georgia. Okay, all right. Yeah. We're not going past. No, no, uh, we're, we're just going the first the first seven games. Okay, because I was gonna say that Arkansas and Missouri, man, this this can be coin flips. So. No, 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 we'll stop. We were stopping there, and then we'll do the rest okay. of the season after that. Yeah, we'll work on that. But yeah. very cool, man. But uh, yeah. Anyways, okay. Well, we 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 were going. We did go essentially all night, and I know. Uh, <laughs> wait, I don't have. Actually, I do have. I do have an early morning, but uh, I have a early morning, but then I have a, a big gap before my next meeting. So uh, we'll call it a day, but Hey, for your, for your Gator nation swamp news debut, I think it was a uh, pretty good alligator. Aaron, we'll hope that you uh, didn't have a bad time and you want to do this again with us. Uh, but uh, of course you guys will see him all around uh, Gator nation um, on the uh, Facebook group, but um, uh, any parting words, anything that you want to say? No, man. I mean, the only thing I got to say is just what everybody else is saying, you know, give the man time give napier time he's recruiting and you know i mean the top three you know already and he's and he's one year in and i mean we've had we're recruiting the best class that we've had in a, at least a decade so give the man time don't make snap judgments over one season you know with with a quarterback that was so inconsistent i believe that napier is the guy to be able to bring us back to prominence and I do believe that if you give the man some time, he will actually exceed your expectations. But you have to be patient. You can't always wake up in the championship. You've got to go through the grind to be able to get to the end result. 
And if you actually give him some patience, I do believe that I think you'll be very surprised at what the man could actually accomplish. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't argue with that. Um, look, uh, I appreciate everybody who did stick around tonight for Sunday night. You know, we wanted to get this on. Got a lot to say. Got a lot more to talk about before the season starts. We're almost there. We're on the tail end of the hottest days of summer as we wind down this 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 little silent season of just of the same things to talk about every single day until there's actual football to be played. We will be here to grind it out with you. Till next time, everybody. This is Joe Blackburn and your man, Aaron Joyner. We'll see you soon. Go Gators. Go Gators.